tonight on Nova, Everest. In 1996, eight died in a single day. Now, Nova takes you back to explore the effects of altitude on the body and mind. He had the nerve to walk on Carol's door. Excellent, David. And a new drama unfolds. Will the summit claim a new victim? What's going on, Ed? David Carroll. Breathing quickly right now won't help you, Carter, and I know this is really scary. Everest, the death zone. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. This program is funded in part by Northwestern Mutual Life, which has been protecting families and businesses for generations. Have you heard from The Quiet Company? Northwestern Mutual Life. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Five and a half miles above sea level, the high Himalayas stand fixed against the wind and clouds. The air is so thin it is not life-sustaining. Within hours, the living begin to deteriorate. But humans come here and struggle for each breath to stand briefly on the highest point on Earth. It's a living hell. The only way to describe it is an utter exhaustion. You really don't care if you die or if you just sit down and don't go any further. In 1996, eight people died in a single day on Everest. Scientists believe many, if not all, of those deaths could have been due to hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. Judgment becomes impaired. The person becomes confused. They don't even know where they are as it gets worse. People hallucinate. So all sorts of mental changes can take place as the brain starts to become more and more abnormal. It's a very slow and arduous process. You take a step, you breathe, you take another step. That's all your mind is occupied with, is taking each individual step. For every six successful summits on Everest, one person will die. With more people climbing into the death zone, above 26,000 feet, one critical question is how oxygen deprivation affects the brain. David Brashears, a high altitude climber and filmmaker, has stood on top of Everest three times. It's just hard work. Everything about being at altitude is hard. We go up with the best technology available to us, the best training, and you can still end up frozen to death at 27,500 feet. That's what makes Everest, Everest. David was making the IMAX film Everest last year when a storm claimed eight climbers' lives. He helped rescue some, but others were beyond help. He is returning to film and lead an expedition that will explore the effects of altitude on the body and mind. Everyone thinks that they're thinking very clearly up high, and yet, by virtue of going up into that atmosphere, you greatly increase your likelihood for making an error. On the early Everest expeditions, climbers trekked for weeks to get to the base of the mountain. Today, they fly into a Sherpa village at 9,000 feet. It will take 10 days to ascend the 9,000 feet in elevation to Everest Base Camp. Base Camp is a temporary city of tents housing 300 people to support nine expeditions. The accommodations may be crude, but most teams have a satellite link to the outside world. It looks like there's about 30 people standing there. David Brashears meets up with his team members and they scope out the route up the mountain. Uh huh. What do you guys think about the upper part there uh, before Camp One? David Carter from Indiana 
is returning to Everest after an unsuccessful yeah, attempt in 1991. We always put ladders there, and that's okay. the toughest part of the whole ice fall there. Ed Veesters yeah. will be guiding Carter. Considered one of today's premier high-altitude mountaineers, Ed has climbed yeah, Everest four go. times, yeah. twice without yeah. oxygen. Big flat area and it doesn't Zhang really Bu Sherpa climbed Everest for the second time on David's last expedition. He is in charge of the large Sherpa staff that will support the team. These climbers will take part in a battery of scientific tests that will gauge their performances at altitude. Ed Viesters lives and trains in Seattle. Two weeks before leaving for the mountain, the climbers joined him at the University of Washington for baseline tests. Dr. Brownie Shaney looks for physiological clues that determine who will perform well at altitude. One determinant is lung capacity. Is it important to have big lungs? Yes, it is, because in that regard, you can move more air obtain more oxygen within the lungs that then the blood can pick up and deliver to the muscle tissues. When we breathe in, oxygen molecules pass through the lungs into the air sacs. Here, purple oxygen deficient blood cells become revitalized and red with oxygen and are pumped by the heart throughout the body. Dr. Shaney measures the climber's heart rates and ability to work. Carter is well above average. At the elite level are Ed Viesters and David Brashears. The elite high altitude climber can trudge through the snow, break trail, climb up a cliff at their maximum capability for hours. Getting close. High on Everest, many climbers approach their maximum heart rate just gasping in the thin air. Okay. Some may collapse, unable right. to go on. Good job, good job. The amount of oxygen in Carter's blood is measured by Dr. Howard Donner. Carter, this little machine that goes beat next to you is an oximeter. The top number here is your saturation, which is a measurement of the amount of oxygen in your blood. 100% means that you're completely saturated, which is what we'd expect close to sea level. As you go higher, this number is going to drop. This lower number is your pulse, and you see you have a nice slow pulse at 63, which is normal for you resting. And uh, as you go up in altitude, a normal response is to see your pulse rate go up. Carter is now given a decreased level of oxygen to simulate going to high altitude. His body strives to get more oxygen. As Carter's blood oxygen saturation falls, his breathing increases and his heart speeds up, trying to pump more blood made red with oxygen to his organs. Over time, more oxygen-carrying blood cells will be produced to carry the oxygen where it is most needed, to the muscles and brain. These physiological changes are called acclimatization, and they enable a person to survive at high altitude. Okay, you're getting a little bit uh, higher altitude, you feel all right? Okay. Due to this sudden exposure to high altitude, Carter's oxygen saturation right. plummets. He will ultimately pass out from the lack of oxygen to his brain. We've found some abnormalities previously in high altitude climbers. Uh, Dr. Peter Hackett addresses the climbers on the effects of decreased oxygen to the brain. One of the more pressing questions in high altitude medicine is, does climbing to extreme altitude cause brain damage? And we're going to be looking at that in a number of ways. One is by MRI scans. Some work indicates that some climbers who go to extreme altitude without oxygen do come back with slightly smaller brains. If cells of the brain actually die, the brain will get smaller. That's what happens with strokes and other things that cause brain cells to die. So we'll look at the volumes of the brain by these special scans. These are unusual people, and they're going to a very unusual place. So there's some opportunities here. David and Ed have been to altitude many times, and we might expect them to react a little bit differently than David Carter, who is a relative newcomer at these kind of extreme altitudes. I've lived by the river for 20 years and only twice before. Psychometric testing so will high. reveal subtle changes in the climber's Two, abilities to process one, information as they six, go higher. One. What we will expect to see is that there's a slowing in speech. There'll be a slowing in reaction time. Uh, we may see a lot of misspeaks. Um, they won't say things quite the way they would at sea level. There'll be slurring and hesitations. This one's a little more difficult. This time what you're going to do is go down the columns and you're going to say the color that you see. You have to disregard the word you see. Tell me the color that the word is printed in. Okay? okay. Go ahead. Blue, red, green, blue, red, blue, 
green, what? red, green, blue, green, blue. Bl Stop. <laughs> that's, that's, that's gonna be fun at altitude. If Charles beats David in a sprint, which man is the faster runner? Charles. People like Ed Viesters and others who make a career out of doing these very high peaks without oxygen may have some long-term brain abnormalities. Some studies indicate that they do have very minor, subtle cognitive dysfunction, and it can be found only on psychometric testing. There's nothing obvious. And their MRIs show that there can be structural changes. We have yet to have a good correlation between the MRI structural changes and the cognitive changes. That's going to take more time, more studies, more research like we're doing now. Dr. Howard Donner treks into base camp where he will be stationed to monitor the health of the climbers. Howard, you made it. And you're moving like an old man. I'm not ready to speak in coherent sentences, okay? So go easy. Welcome to base camp. Thanks, man. Nice Good to, to see you. you. you are... This is Zongbu. Zongbu. Our Sirdar. How are you? Nice our head you know? hey, good to meet you. You know, you look blue. Here, Thanks. give me your hand. I got a pulse oximeter here. I don't trust you with medical oh, devices. Oh, God. Look Maybe at you. Up. You're alive. Okay, good. You know, your saturation level That's 74, and your pulse is about 85. All right. A blood so oxygen okay. level of 74% yeah. would be alarming at sea level, <sighs> but is normal for someone who has just reached 18,000 feet. Well, would you like some tea? Thanks, dude. We'll get you warmed up. As Howard acclimatizes right. over the next few days, the level of oxygen in his blood should increase. If it doesn't, he may become ill with acute mountain sickness. The early warning signs of mountain sickness are primarily headache, followed by dizziness, trouble sleeping, and lack of appetite. And then as it progresses, one develops a more severe headache, nausea and vomiting, and trouble with the balance or coordination. And that is the hallmark sign of progression to definite cognitive problems. I've had altitude sickness before, and I, I know how bad a headache can get. The two things that really affect you are shortage of breath and um, the, the lack of sleep. Sometimes you rest and you feel OK. Then you start walking and it's not OK. <laughs> I feel my head is going too bigger like this. Uh -huh. And I experienced the most shocking headache I've ever had in my life, and I felt sick. And the night time I took two aspirin. After that, so never I uh, failed myself to get a headache. Now I'm fine. <laughs> if symptoms get worse, a portable hyperbaric chamber known as a gamoff bag can help. What's your altimeter say before you get in? See, we're about 17,600 feet. All right. The bag is inflated to increase the pressure inside. This results in a higher density of oxygen molecules. Doug, why don't you watch your altimeter and let us know in a moment what it's telling us. Boy, we're dropping fast. This simulates a descent of several thousand feet where the ambient air holds more oxygen. Doug, what's your altitude? I'm at about 15,300 feet now. At this altitude, pumping this bag up to two PSI will bring a patient down to an altitude inside the bag of about 8,000 feet lower than we are here. Doug, what altitude are you at? We're at 10,900 feet. Most of the time, putting a patient in for a number of hours, they're going to get some benefit. Let's pretend Doug couldn't walk because of severe forms of mountain sickness. We put him in for four or five hours, and now he's able to walk down the hill under his own power. So that's a big help. OK, Doug, I'm going to stop pumping and slowly deflate. Within seconds, the pressure decreases and the patient returns to 17,600 feet. Are your ears okay, Doug? I'm fine. Good, so he's back to base camp. You can tell by the fact that there's no more tension here. Lakpa, yes, can I have a little tea, please? Yes. Thank you very much. It's 5.30 in the morning here at base camp. We'll be doing a little filming today with Zonggu. That's why I'm here. We got our harness on, our boots, and our crampons. And those are all our tools for the ice fall. And so uh, I have to eat and drink and get ready to go. The Kumbu Ice Fall is a steep glacier riddled with deep crevasses and huge ice blocks. It can only be traversed with the use of ladders and rope fixed and maintained by a team of Sherpas. He 
It is here at the beginning of the climb where the greatest objective dangers on Everest lie. On this section, four ladders are strapped together to help climbers scale a hundred foot wall of ice. Zangbu and David use mechanical ascenders to climb up the fixed ropes. This is called jumaring. The ice fall is a jigsaw puzzle of giant blue ice puzzle pieces the size of houses, weighing some 30 tons each. Without warning, the blocks can shift, and crevasses cave in, taking climbers with them. David Jumar is at the last pitch of the ice fall to arrive at Camp One. Okay, everybody down there, this is David from Camp One, ready to proceed with the high altitude tests. And I wanted to start out with uh, giving you my current uh, pulse oximeter reading. Uh, do you copy, and how are you down there? Yeah, we copy, and we're ready to record your uh, pulse oximeter readings. Over. Hi, Jenny. We really miss you up here. Um, now I'm going to stick this thing on my finger, so stand by. My heart is racing because I have to take this damn test up here, and I'm nervous as hell. Oops, it just went up. Um, so, uh, Jenny, I have it on my finger. The um, oximeter reading is 80. Um, a more realistic reading for my pulse was a few minutes ago, it was 78. But now that I have to take this test and I get all this test anxiety, my pulse is racing at 104. Green, uh, red, uh, blue, uh, red, uh, green, red. Along with Ed Viesters, David Carter has also reached Camp One. Red. Carter, this is true and false. I just want you to read the number of each question and tell me whether it's true or false. You have 60 seconds. You can go. 51 is false. 52 is false, 53 is false, 54 false, 55 false, 56 true, 57 false, 58 false, true, 58 is true, 59 uh, uh, true. Hi, Ed. Hi. Have a good sleep? Yeah. Guess where we're going? Base camp. Base camp. Yeah. Yeehaw. Oxygen, warmth, cotton clothing. Wow. <laughs> Shower. Ooh. Hell, it's just down there. <laughs> at the top of the ice fall, there is a bottleneck of climbers. Ed Viesters puts on his pack at the back of the line. It's amazing, you know, you're on Mount Everest and you're waiting in line like this. <laughs> it's only one at a time on the ropes. Ed, David, and Carter all descend back down to base camp from Camp One. This will be the first of many trips through the ice fall in their long schedule of acclimatization. It takes time for the body to adapt to higher and higher altitudes. Climbers will typically ascend to Camp 1 twice from base camp. They move up to Camp 2 and sleep there several nights before moving to Camp 3. Before their final push to the summit, climbers descend to base camp to rest and gain their strength before trying for the summit. While climbing down through the ice fall, the climbers cross paths with a line of Sherpas bearing loads for the higher camps. Sherpa is the name for the indigenous people who live in the Everest region. Although they adapt well to altitude, they're not immune to its debilitating effects. If they push themselves to go up too quickly, they too can suffer from acute mountain sickness. At base camp, the climbers hear the disturbing news of a Sherpa who was found near death, lying in the middle of the trail. When I saw him, his eyes, his pupils were fixed and dilated. He barely had a pulse, and he died several minutes after I got there. 
I think he had high altitude pulmonary edema. With pulmonary edema, the blood vessels in the lungs start to leak. They leak this plasma fluid that is tinged with red blood cells, so it's a little pinkish. And the air sacs start to fill up with, in different parts of the lung, usually the right first and the left, and eventually they all fill up with fluid. The person starts coughing this pink frothy sputum, can't get any air at all. Their blood oxygen level drops, and they go into cardiovascular collapse and die. With each breath, he was blowing bubbles through the fluid in his nostrils and, and, and mouth. He was, drowning in, in, he was drowning in his own secretions from high altitude pulmonary edema. The treatment is descent. If the patient can't walk, then oxygen or a Gamoff bag must be used. Dr. hi. Can I check your saturation again? Mm -hmm. The Malaysian finger. expedition doctor measures a six Sherpa's blood oxygen saturation. But on oxygen, he's now got a saturation of about 91%, which is considerably different to what it was yesterday. This morning at breakfast, we noticed a team carrying this six Sherpa. This is Lagpa by our camp. And uh, we're now at the helicopter landing zone with Dr. Sehak Koo. Um, Sehak, what went on with Lagpa? Well, uh, he was very ill indeed when we, uh, when we came across him. Uh, he was a bit confused. He was quite ashen gray. He was quite breathless as well. And we checked his saturations, and uh, to my alarm, it was 20%. We slapped some oxygen on him, and uh, it came up to about 70, 80% with three or four liters a minute. And because he was able to tolerate lying flat, we decided to put him in the Gamov bag, which we did for um, two hours. And how did he respond to the, the Gamov? Uh, he, he did very well. He was comfortable in it. But the fact that he had symptoms on both sides of his lung and the fact that he was so unwell and so desperately short of oxygen, uh, we treated him for pulmonary edema. When a helicopter arrives at base camp, it means a person is in need of immediate evacuation. And for Lakba, a quick descent to Kathmandu will save his life. Pilots don't hesitate long here, and they breathe supplemental oxygen. If suddenly exposed to the altitude of base camp, the pilot could become desperately ill from acute mountain sickness. In the early morning freeze, the climbers silently put on their crampons to climb up through the icefall for the last time. The team has been on Everest for several weeks, acclimatizing at the higher camps. Time is running out for an attempt on the summit. Carter has developed a high-altitude cough, which he knows could jeopardize his chances of completing the climb. It's a real violent cough. It comes from deep within, and uh, you can't control it. My main concern right now is when I get higher, the cough will get worse and I'm worried about breaking a rib or uh, vomiting or something. A chilling reminder of how dangerous Everest can be. Human remains resurface from the depths of the moving icefall. We came upon this the other day in the glacier. It's the obvious remains of a, of a climber spread out around this area. This is uh, an inner boot made out of a synthetic material, making it probably 80s vintage. And there's still portions of the bony structure of the foot inside. Right here, maybe the most obviously human portion of the skeleton is the head of the femur. And uh, over here, a tibia and a fibula still intact, still together. And this kind of stuff is spilling out all the time in a, a reminder of some of the drama that goes on up in the icefall. The climbers bypass Camp 1 and enter the Western Coombe on their way to Camp 2. This high glacial valley is transected by massive lateral crevasses.
Good feeling, Ed. Well, pretty good. It was a long day. It's about uh, 12.30. I started at 5 a.m. So it's been Where'd a long you start day. from? Base camp. Don't you have something really fun to do today? No, nothing fun. Just relaxing. I thought you were going to do some testing up here. Oh, yeah, we got to do some testing. That's right. Oh, mental testing, reading some lists and memorizing and stuff like that. What do you think you're gonna do? I have no idea. We'll soon find out. Okay, Carter, the action of the brave cyclist kept the small boy from being hit by a 10 ton truck. The action of the brave cyclist kept the small boy from being hit by a 10 ton truck. If Daphne walks twice as fast as Margaret and they are the only two people in a race, who is most likely to finish last? Margaret. Okay, now you know for this test, David, you're going to try and count the low tones and ignore the high tones. Ready? How many? Uh, four. Today I'm suffering badly. We're up at six and a half thousand meters. And uh, often one feels fairly poorly here anyway. I think I was suffering from. AMS, acute mountain sickness, um, which with vomiting and diarrhea means that I couldn't drink or or eat anything. So I'm feeling a bit weak. This is the part of high altitude mountaineering that that isn't nice. Being being sick, uh, it's hard enough as it is, but um, when you're sick as well, uh, all your reserves are gone, and uh, it's very hard to catch up. If Guy Cotter's symptoms get worse, he'll have to descend. There is a delicate balance between acclimatization and physical decline. Climbers know that they can only stay at altitude for so long. You know, I'm nervous. I, I don't know how I'm going to perform. Um, I, I'm also nervous that we're sitting down here and, and my body is slowly deteriorating the longer we stay at this altitude. And I, and I slowly get weaker and weaker. Humans will start to deteriorate because of the high altitude at around 17,000 feet. <coughs> Sleeping becomes a problem, muscle wasting takes place, weight loss takes place. This process of deterioration takes place much more quickly the higher altitude that one goes to. So at over 26,000 feet is called the death zone because acclimatization is essentially impossible. Going to camp uh, three tomorrow. We're gonna get up early. Around, uh, we're gonna get out of here probably about six o'clock. <coughs> I'm on an antibiotic now. I ended up getting a pretty good head cold about three days ago. And uh, yesterday, I was really feeling pretty bad when I came into camp too. I was dehydrated and uh, basically just weak from the cold. But the antibiotics have been kicking in and uh, I'm feeling pretty good today. And uh, Looking forward to going tomorrow. In the morning, they march to the top of the Western Coombe, where they begin the arduous ascent of the Lhotse face. Hey, David, you can start any time. Carter to uh, base, do you copy? Hey, this is Bay. Where are you guys, over? Hey, Doc, it's Dave. We're at the, basically the bottom of the Lhotse face, uh, where our elevation is at uh, 22,300, and it's about 8 o'clock in the morning. We got that, David. How you feeling uh, overall, over? Uh, not too bad. I could be feeling a little bit better right now. Oximetry data, if you have it, over. Uh, pulse is around 140 when I rolled in. And uh, blood oxygen saturation with 60 over. 60% is low, but Howard is hopeful that Carter's saturations will improve over time. David Brashears interviews Carter an hour below Camp 3. How does it feel? Ah, it's tiring. I feel I felt better. <coughs> I feel like climbing at altitude. Ah. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's slow, <coughs> you're winded, uh, dehydrated, losing your voice, uh, coughing, 
but the views make it worth it. Camp 3 sits halfway up the Lhotse face, a 45-degree wall of glacial blue ice. Okay, let's huff and puff it up here. The pace is slow as Ed and Carter ascend into thin air. The route is fixed with ropes, and they fall into the rhythmic movement of kicking steps, pulling, and stepping up. Find that camp for you. Yeah. Good job. It's good to be here. We gotta get some uh, some snow and melt some water okay. for those guys coming up. Be careful walking around here, though. It's kind of steep, especially without crampons on. Yeah. Many climbers have died here, slipping <laughs> off the face from one poorly placed step. <coughs> Don't you think this is a little absurd? I'm sitting on this little ledge out here in front of my tent at 24,000 feet. I'm ready. The video camera captured the bank robber's daring daylight robbery of the First Avenue Bank. The video camera captured the daring bank robber's robbery of the First National Bank. <laughs> cyclist kept the small boy from being hit by the 10 ton truck. The action of the brave cyclist um, helped uh, save the boy, uh, let's see, I know I have to say all I know, uh, prevent the boy being hit by the 10 ton truck. <sighs> oh, shit. It's just hard work. Everything about being at altitude is hard. I can't show you that there's no oxygen molecules in the air here. There's only 35% of the oxygen you're breathing down there at sea level available to me right now. We have to finish this expedition. The ice falls going to close. Our permit's up. We've been here a long time, but we're also extremely cautious and we're not going to push it one bit. We'll do our research as high as we can and go home uh, knowing we've done the best we can. Oh, I'll just sleep. Good. Yeah, yeah the oxygen really helped. <coughs> oh, that was great. <coughs> oh, yeah. Carter, this is Howard. Um, how you feel your breathing's going relative to this uh, upper respiratory infection? Over. Uh, real good now, a lot better. Howard, it was a lot worse when I was, uh, you know, I'd wake up after two hours and I felt like I had a lot of shit in my throat and I'd cough it up. It's kind of a hard chunk, snot type shit. It was yellow. Over. Well, sounds like maybe you're clearing this stuff out. Over. <laughs> yeah, after a few hot drinks and uh, uh, getting off O's and uh, breathing through my nose, uh, I feel a lot better. All righty. All right, where are you now? I, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm kidding. We're at Camp 3. We're getting ready to move out. Carter is about to go higher than he has ever been before. Looking up the route, some 50 climbers clamor towards the highest camp on the mountain. This makes David Brashears and Ed Viesters very nervous. They witnessed last year that crowded ropes on Everest can be deadly. This year, it seems nothing has changed. As climbers wait their turn on the ropes, they increase their chances of becoming hypoxic. Tonight, they will all leave camp and climb toward the summit. David and Ed climb into the death zone an altitude where humans are only transient visitors. The tents of Camp 4 finally come into view. It has taken nearly two months for the climbers to reach this point, and what will transpire over the next 24 hours will change their lives. Oxygen bottles from expeditions years ago litter this wind-scoured place. Spare oxygen. 
10 stakes and beyond corpse. When you die at 26,000 feet, no one has the energy to carry your corpse off the mountain. The climbers are slowly deteriorating, their bodies literally consuming themselves for energy. You need the red string. Walk. Simple tasks take longer to perform, and precious energy is burned just gasping for air. While most climbers are resting, David, Ed, and Carter endure another round of psychometric tests. Old houses are more difficult to maintain, but worth the extra time and effort. Old houses are more difficult to maintain, but are worth the extra effort. I lived by the river for 20 years. And only twice before in all those years has it been this high. Ed lived by the river for 20 years. And uh, this was the, uh, the first time it had been this high. Over. The wildflowers bloomed in profusion in the high meadows in August. <coughs> David radios Ed, who is in a nearby tent. The scene feels all too familiar. Ed? Tuned in, what's going on? I'm uh, having serious doubts about going up today. Something about climbing with all these people, it's got me bothered in the way that a few days last year had me bothered. What do you think? It does concern me. There's a lot of relatively inexperienced people. Hopefully, nobody's going to get in trouble. If they do, of course, the more experienced people always have to help out. And then who looks after who up there, you know? How do you sort that out? Well, I don't like to be around people staggering around like that, and I don't know. I'd like to see this day just kind of sort itself out without me in it. It's a brief moment of doubt, but in the end, David decides to go up, knowing he can always turn around. Five hours later, the climbers prepare for their departure. At this altitude, loading a pack and putting on crampons will take two hours. Each climber carries two bottles of oxygen. They leave at 10 p.m. When one considers the condition that a climber is in on the South Coal on summit day, it's really amazing that they can reach the summit at all. First of all, there hasn't been sleep for usually a couple nights. There hasn't been enough to eat or drink. Even if they've been on oxygen, it's still been very uncomfortable to breathe. The mucous membranes are all dried out. There's always a sore throat. There's always a cough. There's often a headache. And it takes a tremendous amount of will to keep going under these conditions. At 5.30 in the morning and 300 feet below the summit, David calls down to Howard. We've been climbing like crazy. We're on the South Summit, 28,700 feet. It's unbelievable. And you climb in the middle of the night, and you're standing up there in the early morning. They sit down to rest. 10 feet in front of them lies the body of Rob Hall, one of the expedition leaders who died in 1996. David points to where Rob is buried under wind-driven snow. How far buried do you think he is? Five feet? Five. Could be five or six feet. Right. It's a lot. Yeah. Rest in peace. They have only 300 vertical feet to go, but two hours of climbing. They traverse a knife edge ridge which drops off 8,000 feet on both sides. David climbs in front. They reach the Hillary Step, a 40-foot wall of exposed rock. This is the most technical terrain on the summit day. Climbers maneuver up the cracks and over the rocky outcrop while clipped into the fixed ropes. Carter hoists himself up. Only one climber can ascend at a time. This is where bottlenecks occur. Damn. 
they silently pass by the body of a climber from an earlier expedition who died here on the ropes. The breathing becomes unbelievably difficult. You feel like you're one huge lung. The heart rate at rest becomes higher and higher. The maximum heart rate becomes lower and lower. And as you go higher, those two get closer and closer together. And of course, when your resting heart rate equals your maximum heart rate, all you can do is rest. You can't do any more physical work. They've climbed for nine hours. Zangbu raises the Tibetan flag on the summit. David is sitting on the top. Ed is taking the last steps up with Carter just behind. Base camp, base camp. This is David. Do you read me? David, we read you loud and clear. Where are you over? Howard, I'm on top of the world. We <laughs> made it. I'm on the summit of Mount Everest, 29,028 feet. I'm here with David Carter, Ed Beasters. I can see everywhere. It's just so beautiful. I'm not going to be able to stay here very long. David Brashears has reached the summit of Mount Everest for the fourth time. Ed Vesters has now become the first non-Sherpa to climb Everest five times in return. Rob Hall's fifth summit last year was tragically his last. Carter has lost his voice and will be unable to take the world's highest psychometric tests. Mike walked around the block three times before he had the nerve to knock on Carol's door. Mike walked around the block three times before he had the nerve to walk on Carol's door. Excellent, David. Do you have any oximetry on the summit? I'm at 78, sitting on top of Everest. At 78, David's blood oxygen saturation is good for a climber breathing supplemental oxygen. Climbers consume bottled oxygen in a flow of two liters per minute on the summit day. With his mask off for a few minutes, David's respiratory rate increases significantly. David, what's it like climbing back in the same area that you were in last year? Over. All the bodies that were there last year were covered, but unfortunately, we did pass one body right on the fixed ropes. It only makes me question my sanity and why I've climbed this mountain again, because it is dangerous and cold. Ed takes his final psychometric test on Everest. The man who was an engineer came to the store where Alice worked to buy pastries. Who bought pastries? Uh, the engineer, Jack, the guy. <laughs> Where was Alice? In the store. Ed, I know you want to get moving again. Let us know how you're doing. How are you feeling? Over? I feel fine. It's getting kind of cold. It's just right now. The descent is quite arduous. You're physically spent. You have to think about what you're doing. You can't just stagger and slug your way down. A lot of accidents in mountaineering occur on the descent, and it's because people get to the summit and they're totally let down their guard, and they've used all of their energy just to get to the top. It takes five hours to climb down to Camp 4. In the safety of his tent, David reveals to Howard that he had a difficult climb to the summit. Howard, this is South Cole. Hey, David, this is Howard. Go ahead. This morning I drank about a quart of Kool-Aid. Then I slept. I threw up <coughs> about <coughs> six times. I thought I would have to come down, but I didn't want to leave the team behind because it was just, I, I kept thinking I'd feel better. I um, had the worst trip down in the South Summit I've ever had. Over. I got that, David. How's everybody doing, over? <laughs> we gotta get these guys out of here. He's a little sick. David Carter's condition has worsened. Despite his own illness, David Brashears picks up the camera to shoot Ed taking care of Carter. Tell me what's up. He's at 93 and 133, so uh, your pulse ox is really good. Today we your throat feels real side, constricted? So. Yes. Okay. He's on four liter flow. David started having problems coming down on the south summit. I couldn't catch his breath. So we called the doc at base camp, told him what was going on, and he doesn't, doesn't know whether it's something uh, like pulmonary edema or possibly uh, the fact that David was having some uh, 
lung infection earlier on that he's been fighting and, and whether the altitude just exacerbated that. So I think the best option, if he can handle it, is to get him down to camp two. The lower we get him, the better. What about uh, oxygen at camp two? Yeah, there's a bottle. They have just climbed to 29,028 feet, the summit of Everest, an exhausting accomplishment. Now they will try to descend 5,000 more feet to get Carter to a safer altitude. Hey, David. Good luck, man. Sorry you had to get sick like this. David Brashear stays at Camp Four to rest as Ed accompanies Carter. He would go 10 or 20 feet, and then we'd stop for five minutes. You know, he'd have to catch his breath. He'd have to take his mask off. He was overheating, uh, desperately trying to gain control of his breathing. I thought we could get to Camp Two, but as it turned out, it took us a long time. It took four and a half hours to get down to Camp Three. So it was about 7 p.m. then, and we got into the tent, and that's when it started to get a little hairy. After hours of labored breathing, Carter gains enough strength to get on the radio. Carter, my man, how you doing? I'm still alive. It's been a hell of a day. Tell me, um, this is very important, Carter. I need to get a feeling for whether you feel like your lungs are full of fluid, do you feel like it's difficult to get air? You feel really short of breath? Or do you feel more like it's wheezy in your upper airway, like you have asthma, over? Uh, I really don't feel like I have anything in my lungs. Uh, it, it feels like my throat is closed up on me. Uh, or I have asthma, something like that. Last night, I coughed up a, a lot of cream, hard. Uh, a couple of them blood over. Carter seems to be improving, but two hours later, a desperate call from Ed. What's going on, Ed? Ed, I'm going to keep talking. You don't have to respond. See if you can do a Heimlich and get him to expel whatever is obstructing. Over. Okay, Ed, listen to me. I'm not sure where you're at. If it's an obvious obstruction, you can push it out with a Heimlich, do that. If it just seems like uh, Carter's airway is closing and you need to breathe for him, go ahead and start mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. Over. Okay, hang on, I did. I have a dozen Heimlichs and it seemed to help. Tell me what Carter's doing now. What is his respiratory status, over? Uh, he's sitting up. We did some more Heimlichs. It seems like he's calming down a little bit. Hang on. Okay, what's very important, Carter, for you is I want you to take nice, easy, slow, deep breaths. Breathing quickly right now won't help you, Carter, and I know this is really scary. You're going to do fine, but I need you to breathe deep in and out, and in and out slowly, and know that Ed and the rest of us are going to take care of you. Over. David was desperately gasping for air. I wasn't sure he was going to make it through the night. I mean, he had his doubts, and it's a scary situation to be up there all alone, thinking that, you know, here this guy might die on you. There we go. Looks like we have a record level. That light came on. That's plugged in. Okay, David, what's going on? It's been a long... <coughs> it's been a really long couple days for me. I've been very sick coming down. I'm totally exhausted without so having problems getting a full breath. My uh, throat feels like I'm breathing through a straw right now. This is God's gift up here. That was the first time in my life when I literally thought I was going to die. I still to this point have not even thought of summoning. I just want to get down the mountain. Choking to death at 23,000 feet. The first thing that went through my mind was how isolated I am, and I'm not going to be rushed to a hospital and revived. I knew that when I was choking, there's just two people there. It was myself and Ed, and it was frightening. I don't want to die. 
I don't want to die in the mountains. I don't want to die young. But since I've survived it, it's a big part of my life now. Ten days after coming off Everest, the climbers returned to Seattle for a final session of testing. The scientists have now had a chance to analyze the data. The pulse oximetry data collected on this expedition showed, as expected, the decline in oxygen with uh, higher ascent to altitude. And David Carter, in particular, had lower blood oxygen levels, which seemed to go along with some of the problems he was having on the mountain. We need to do more careful analysis of the relationship of the pulse oximeter readings to the MRI scans. Dr. Hackett has looked closely at the MRI scans, searching for abnormalities. He discovers that exposure to extreme altitude can leave its mark on the human brain. Climbers without oxygen. Hackett addresses the climbers. And actually, the only abnormality we found was a very mild atrophy in the brain of Ed Wiesters, who is the one that has climbed many times to high altitude without supplemental oxygen. And what we'd like to do is follow him over a longer period of time to see if uh, this is something that might actually progress with his high altitude career. Ed lived by the river. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. And uh, this was the uh, our first time it had been this high. Over. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. <laughs> Man, you were feeling bad yeah. there. We have reviewed all the tests you see, and, and you can see that there's a real difference in your performance uh, at high altitude. At the higher elevations, you're obviously in survival mode. From the numbers, we could see that your performance was deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And had we had those numbers available, we would have probably suggested that you might not want to continue. I'm shocked, and I, I realize now how sick I was. And I, you just, you don't, it, it's just a haze up there. You can't no, tell up no, there. No, no. We're all just getting by. Yeah. I'm looking at David for the first time at Camp 4. And uh, typically, you know, I'm talking to him on the radio. And in fact, you saw when he was coughing, he had the microphone off. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing his responses. I'm not watching him cough or seeing how awful he looks. The question then we ask is, what happens if you're in an emergency situation are you able to think quickly? Are you able to think clearly about what you need to do to survive and get down? You can see how in his condition he could have not tied his rope correctly, not tied into his harness correctly, right. not clipped into the anchor correctly. <laughs> I love this mountain. I, I have learned a lot. I, you know, I summited, but I still don't even think about the summit. I'm still thinking about that night at Camp 3 being near death, possibly dying. When I passed by the last ladder in the ice fall, I knew that I had survived Mount Everest. David, uh, we're curious, now that you've been to the top, you think this was your last trip up this mountain, over? Well, it's the hardest day I've ever had on the mountain. And I have no intention of ever going to the top of Everest again. I need lots of people to prevent me from changing my mind. Take the test yourself. See the 360 views from the top. Return to Everest and experience everything but the extreme altitude. Start climbing at www.pbs.org. Educators can order this show for $19.95 plus shipping and handling by calling 1-800-255-9424. And to learn more about how science can solve the mysteries of our world, ask about our many other Nova videos.
Nova is a production of WGBH Boston. Major funding for Nova is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. This program is funded in part by Northwestern Mutual Life, which has been protecting families and businesses for generations. Have you heard from the quiet company? Northwestern Mutual Life. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. This is PBS.